Hello, everyone. Hey, everyone. Okay, so welcome to our Emojis and the Law event presented by Professor Eric Goldman. He's the co-director of the uh, High Tech Law Institute and our advisor for the Internet Law Student Organization. Brand new student organization. We started it about a month ago with the goal to inform students and future students about careers in tech and internet law um, and to kind of make Santa Clara Law the place to study internet law. Um, so we're excited to have you guys here. Uh, we'll have cake at the end of the presentation. This is our board. Uh, and yeah, if you want to become a student member, we'll have a sign up sheet that we're going to be passing around the room. There's no dues, everything's free, no big responsibilities. Um, one of the perks of becoming a student member, we're, we're having a uh, Facebook on-site event uh, probably in April. And if you're a student member, you'll get the email first for signing up. It's going to be limited spots. But uh, you guys will hear before uh, any of the rest of the school does, I guess, unless the whole school signs up. But yeah, uh, welcome, and thanks for coming. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Goldman. I'm a member of the faculty. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about emojis and the law. Um, before we do, I want to congratulate the students for putting together the Internet Law Student Organization. You may not appreciate it, but this is a new initiative for the school, and I believe it may be a new initiative for the world. Um, I'm not aware of many, if any, other uh, student groups that focus exclusively on Internet law. So I think we're doing something special here, and it really it's a great honor for me to be a part of that. Um, the, uh, um, it's a special honor then, of course, for me to be the inaugural talk of this. Uh, this is, I hope, going to be a kickoff to a long and successful group that's going to uh, make a difference to this community. Um, where's the sign-up sheet? Is it already passing around? OK, fantastic. Um, though the group is new, Santa Clara uh, Law School has been a leader in internet law for a long time. I personally started teaching internet law here back in 1997. Um, and since then, there's, this school has had a leadership role in the community for uh, in a variety of different ways. For example, we've all held several groundbreaking conferences um, that have really, I think, defined uh, the discussion for internet law for uh, the, uh, the, the um, country and our community. Um, we also have alumni in pretty much every internet company you've heard of, and many that you've never heard of. Um, Santa Clara Law is the pipeline school to uh, the uh, internet companies that are defining uh, the internet for the next generation. Um, so what we do here is influencing uh, the decisions that are being made uh, at the internet companies as people like you go on into positions like that. Um, the group is titled the Internet Law Student Organization. What is internet law? Well, this is the first week of the internet law course. It's something you might choose to take. Um, but for now, let's think about it as uh, thinking about how we develop the law as there's uh, developments in new communicative technologies. So uh, technology is rapidly evolving. The way in which we talk to each other is rapidly evolving. The internet law discourse is basically how do we think about that process and how do we develop the rules to, um, uh, to fit the new developments. And of course, um, then as practitioners, we think about and how do we make decisions in a situation where the law is constantly evolving and the technology is constantly evolving as well? One of the standard protocols for internet law is to think about what's unique, special, or different from other technologies or other communication media that humans have used in the past. Um, if there's nothing unique, special, or different about the technology at issue, then whatever law we develop for the last technology or the, the present technology can apply verbatim. We don't have to develop new rules. We already have rules. There's nothing different about them. When we find something unique, special, or different, we call it exceptionalism. There's something exceptional about this particular technology. And exceptionalism then becomes a prompt for us to think about, we can't take the old rules and just apply them verbatim. We have to do something different. We have to either create new rules or think about new ways of um, uh, dealing with a situation. So this particular topic, emotions and law, might not have struck you as the first thing you might have thought of under internet law. But actually, for me, it's a fantastic case study of how internet law works. Um, what we have is a new communicative technology, emojis, and we have to then figure out, do the old rules apply, or are there new rules that we're going to have to develop to accommodate anything that's exceptional about emojis? So we're going to look at that question. The methodologies I applied to this topic, emojis and law, is exactly what I do as an internet law scholar. Same basic question, what's unique, special, or different here? Um, 
Before we get started, I do want to give a special shout out to uh, a, uh, one of your colleagues, Brian Pettis, right here in the front, who's shaking his head in embarrassment. Um, when I was first working on this project about two years ago, I reached a fork on the road where I wasn't sure, do I have something here or not? And in conversations with Mr. Pettis, he told me, you have to do this project. This is going to be a, an important paper. Go for it. And honestly, uh, before that conversation, I wasn't sure what to do. After that conversation, I decided he was right, and I went and did it. These are the kinds of discourses that we have here in this building. You as students are constantly influencing your professors. I hope uh, you recognize that. Uh, it is not a one-way street here. This uh, talk is a testament to how that dialogue works. Um, this topic is also a great topic because everyone loves emojis. Is that true? Am I wrong about that? Is there anyone in the room who's never used an emoji? Is there anyone? Is there, how many of you have used an emoji since I've started talking? <laughs> the multitaskers. I love emojis. Now, sometimes there's a little generational stereotyping about who uses emojis, and I'm often not included in that generational stereotype. Um, but I love emojis. How much do I love emojis? I am wearing an emoji tie. First of all, wearing a tie is a big deal for me. Second of all, I'm wearing an emoji tie. This is what I asked for from my kids for my birthday. I am also wearing emoji socks, which I am now about to display to you. You guys think I'm joking. This is actually true. These are emoji socks, custom knitted for me by a friend. Um, I am also wearing emoji underwear, but that you will just have to accept on my assertion. <laughs> Okay, let's talk a little about the law. Um, first, first question I get in this project always, what's your favorite emoji? You cannot have a single favorite emoji. It's like asking me what's my favorite child. Um, but I've got at least several that I love more than others, like the emoji hard eyes, uh, the cow emoji, whatever, the Facebook thumbs up, or any other thumbs up is pretty good with me. And of course, the poop emoji, which even made its appearance today on the cake that you're about to eat. Enjoy your poop emoji cake. Um, Let's start by defining our terms. What are emojis? Um, and you'll see that this is an important part of that understanding the legal implications of emojis. We have to be very precise about our terminology. Let's start with the old technology, emoticons. Um, so I was using emoticons back in the 1990s. They actually predate uh, that quite a bit. Um, emoticons is a portmanteau of uh, emotion and icon. And it was one of the first times that we actually had the ability to add some emotional content into otherwise pretty pure text-based messages. Back in the old days, all we had were characters on our keyboards. We had, didn't have any real capacity to send images whatsoever. And emoticons were a way of adding a visual imagery to our messages in order to, um, uh, to uh, communicate. Now, emoticons are formed using your keyboard characters. You'll type something like a colon, a dash, and a close parenthesis to make a smiley. And because of that, so long as everyone was using the same translation mechanism for interpreting keyboard characters, your emoticons came through no problem. Whenever you sent them across the internet, everyone saw the same thing. Um, a variation of the emoticon are the uh, cow emojis, so whatever cow emoji, for example, this is actually a uh, Japanese uh, script. Um, and the thing about cow emojis is that they're actually read horizontally as opposed to, um, uh, uh, um, or they present horizontally as opposed to vertically. Um, but m nowadays we focus mostly on emojis, which are Japanese word for picture word, which is actually a pretty good uh, a description of them. And there are two main types of emojis, and this is really crucial to the legal analysis, to parse the different types of emojis. First, there are what I'll call the Unicode emojis. So Unicode is a standard setting body. Um, they have been involved with the development of standards for communicating fonts and keyboard characters using fonts um, through, uh, for, for quite some time. Um, and so because of the fact that they are used to keyboard characters, it was a natural extension for them to pick up and try and also accommodate things that were on, sitting next to keyboard characters, like emojis. And so Unicode has developed a protocol for assigning unique numbers for thousands of different symbols. And the idea is that that unique number will be recognized by everyone who honor, honors Unicode standard, which means that um, if I send a, a, an emoji that Unicode recognizes using the unique number 
the machine that receives the message that I'm sending will see that unique number and then will say, I understand what symbol this person's trying to send and I now know what to do to present a similar uh, depiction. So the idea is that uh, the Unicode standard allows emojis to be sent from my desktop to a recipient across networks and everyone is uh, clear on what unique numbers associated with that symbol that moves from point to point. However, uh, Unicode doesn't uh, require the particular depiction of any symbol associated with that unique number. So Unicode will say, this is supposed to be the smiling face, but each um, uh, system can decide how they want to pick the smiling face um, however they see fit. And we're gonna look at what that means um, in, uh, throughout the rest of the talk. So here's an example of the cow emoji. Now, uh, I've prepared this uh, talk over the course of several years. Some of these images are out of date. You would find something different nowadays, but work with me anyway. Um, the, the principles haven't changed. Uh, so on the left is the Unicode outline for the cow emoji. If I want to send a cow emoji, there's a unique number in the Unicode system that is associated with that particular cow. But then what you see uh, to the right of the, of the far left is different ways that the platforms have decided to implement that particular unique number that's assigned by Unicode. So you can see that some of them implement it with pretty faithful depictions of the outline. You can see some others go much more cartoonish. You can see some of them have black and white slots. You can see that others have brown depictions. And so though I might see one of these on my system, the recipient might see one of the other ones if they're on a different system. So though there is standardization by Unicode to say we're always talking about a cow, the cow that I see and the cow that the recipient see might be different, and that's going to have legal implications. There's also a different uh, flavor of emojis uh, that I'll call proprietary emojis, or sometimes you'll refer to them as stickers, but there's a bunch of other names for these things. Um, and these are uh, um, emojis that only work within a single platform. So uh, let's talk about uh, Twitch. Uh, some of you might be using the Twitch. There's, uh, I believe it's called emotes. Um, and if you send an emote within Twitch, everyone's going to see the same thing within the Twitch network. If you try to send the emote outside of Twitch, odds are that the recipient system, whatever other platform it is, won't be able to process that symbol. They won't know what it means. They won't recognize it, and that's going to create some communication problems. Um, so we use these interchangeably. We may not even know which emojis we're using are Unicode defined, and therefore if they leave the network is going to be seen in something similar but different, or which one is a proprietary emoji and it's never going to be seen if it's sent outside the system. Okay, so let me give you the quick overview of the talk. Um, so despite the fact that Unicode has tried to standardize emojis, emojis are in fact depicted in multiple ways um, in different platforms. And this depiction diversity hurts users. It hurts all of us by causing misunderstandings. So um, it's actually creating misunderstandings that might not have otherwise exist. And the reason why we have depiction diversity, I hypothesize, is due to intellectual property protection. That emojis will be protected by intellectual property, and therefore that's going to drive some behavior that increases or exacerbates the depiction diversity. And providing this IP protection is both counterproductive and unimpressive. Unprecedented. It's unprecedented because we don't have good examples of other ways in which communication building blocks have been protected by IP, and it's kind of productive because it's actually adding misunderstandings where none need to exist. Okay, let me pack, unpack all this. Let's start with the interpretation challenges of emoji. This is Internet Law 101. We're doing my exceptionalist analysis. What's unique, special, or different about emojis? So let's take a look at some examples of things that might be unique, special, or different. First of all, emojis are visually small, and uh, so they're sometimes a little bit hard to decode. Now, you guys have fresh eyes, but as my eyes get older, the emojis get harder to see. So I gave you an example here. Uh, these are the grinning um, uh, face with smiling eyes and the grinning face, smiling eyes with a sweat beat. Now, uh, when I blow it up to this size, you can see that those are two different symbols, but when it's on a smaller, uh, phone, and I'm trying to decode that, I may not be able to tell that those are two different symbols. And so it's possible that I'm going to misunderstand the emojis just because I can't properly decode them. Furthermore, even if I can decode the emojis, they're constantly changing. I already mentioned my slides are out of date because the emojis are constantly being uh, uh, refined, changed, uh, iterated 
And so even if I knew what one looked like, I might over time find that it looks a little bit different and I might be confused by that. Emojis um, uh, in the Unicode system are designed to have multiple meanings. Uh, what does this mean? This symbol? What? High five. Prayer. Thanks. What else? Any, any, anything else? Blessings. What? Like blessings. Blessings, yeah. Um, also, this is sometimes used as a please. Um, so these are all pretty well accepted uh, definitions of this particular symbol. And the lawyer says, well, boy, that seems like that's going to create some confusion, is it? I might be sending one of the meanings and someone else might have a different meaning and not know that there's all these other meanings. Unicode used that as a feature. They want emojis that can be used in multiple circumstances. If you have a single purpose emoji, they view that as a uh, failing of the emoji. They want it to be um, uh, more widely used in more circumstances. So emoji, uh, the Unicode system deliberately chooses emojis that have multiple meanings. They guarantee that, that those emojis are going to create additional confusion over time. That's, they view that as a feature, not a bug. The lawyers say that sounds like a bug. We also don't have a settled grammar for how to interpret emojis in a string. So what I'm gonna give you in this bottom here, this is actually a litigated message, uh, text message. This is from a uh, small claims uh, court case in Israel. So you might be saying, okay, Goldman, you're really digging. But this is actually, I think, quite illustrative. Work with me for a moment. Uh, the issue uh, was that um, a landlord had advertised an apartment for rent and a prospective tenant sends the following text message. Good morning with a uh, smiley emoji. Interested in the house, we got the uh, dancing woman or Spanish dancer, the uh, woman with bunny ears, the peace sign, the comet, the chipmunk, and the champagne bottle or the bottle with the cork popping. Just need to discuss the details. When's a good time for you? Okay, contracts experts, do we have a offer and or acceptance in this message? Right, everyone can understand the question there. We clearly have an expression of interest. Do we have something that rises to level? If there was an offer, that this would constitute a manifestation of, accept, of um, acceptance. Under US law, I think we'd say unambiguously, this was not an acceptance. Now, Israel has a special law that says that if you negotiate in bad faith, that can be independently actionable, even if you never got to the point where you manifest assent and formed a contract. So, what at issue here is, you know what happened, of course. Why did this case go to small claims court? Prospective tenant strings along the landlord long enough, uh, landlord's losing prospective rent, and then the prospective tenant goes to them and says, uh, I'm not going to take the apartment. Landlord's like, I held this place for you because you promised to me that you were interested. Um, and so the question is, did this message send enough signals to the landlord to uh, communicate that the tenant wanted to take the place uh, sufficient that it was reasonable for the landlord to hold it off the market and wait. Um, okay, so what do these emojis mean in <laughs> sequence? Okay, slow down for a moment. Um, I reverse the order. Some of you may know that Hebrew is read right to left as opposed to left to right. And I have now put it so the emojis read left to right as opposed to right to left. Okay, so I worry monkeyed with this uh, situation. So first question is, what order do we even read the emojis in? And now the question is, how do we sit them next to each other? What do these emojis mean in sequence? The court said, these were symbols that the uh, tenant was delighted with having ended their search for a place. And therefore, they were signaling to the uh, respective uh, landlord that they wanted to do this deal, that this was they were like celebrating already. Um, and we might say that the dancing woman and the uh, woman with bunny ears uh, and the champagne um, uh, bottle would all be symbols of possibly some kind of joy or affirmation. Those look all pretty good. Okay, um, what about the peace sign? Well, I don't know what to interpret this as. This might be maybe a victory sign. So we could interpret that as a positive thing. Uh, how about the comment though? What does the comment mean? And what does it mean in context? Normally, historically, comments were uh, 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 signals of doom and gloom coming. They were a sign that the earth was about to end. Um, but then we have the chipmunk. What does the chipmunk mean? <laughs> I have asked many audiences. I have asked many Israelis. 
What does the chipmunk mean? Oh, do you have a hypothesis? That they really need the house to store their stuff in the winter. Okay, all right. Israel has mild winters, uh, so I think that that's probably not the light, most likely interpretation, but okay, I like it. Yeah, you can see the chipmunk actually has got that little acorn there, right? That acorn needs a house. Yeah. Prospective tenant has pets. Prospective tenant has pets. Okay, that's a new one to me. So the idea would be that the Spanish dancing and the bunny, women with bunny ears also are bringing their chipmunk along with them. Um, so. Something. Pets and alcohol? Pets and alcohol. Well, we already know that if any of you were sending us that message, alcohol is coming either way, right? <laughs> so that kind of goes without saying. I saw another hand over here. So, yeah. Maybe the neighborhood has chipmunks in it, or has some sort of like animals, and it's just attracted to them. Like it's set in a nice area where it's like kind of rural-ish. <laughs> So, to me, chipmunks are wrapped with furry tails. So, to me, I don't view them as cute, I view them as rose tails. Um, <laughs> um, okay, uh, but notice that the prospective tenant has, may not have even seen the place. I'm not sure they have seen the place by the time they got this one. This is their first message saying, hey, I'm interested. Let me give a chance at this. We just need to work out the details. Like, I need to see it. I need to work out the rent and when we start. Um, OK, so do you see now the grammar problem here? So the question is, that what do each of these mean in isolation? But how do we read them together? Now, let me throw out a hypothesis that the chipmunk is actually Israeli for F you. Now, I don't think that's true. The Israelis have not told me that. But one might then take this message and say, wow, this is like a sarcasm chipmunk. This chipmunk is actually evil. This is not a celebration message. And it might change the entire meaning of the sequence of emoji characters. It might further change the entire meaning of the message. So we have to read the emojis in sequence with each other. But we don't have a standardized rule for how to do that. We don't know how to put these emojis together sufficient to actually understand then um, how to read them in sequence. Um, this is another example. Now, this is going to change, of course. We will develop a sta standardized grammar for emojis in sequence. We just haven't done so that's reliable yet. And every time you see emojis in sequence, think about now what grammar rules you're applying and recognize that odds are that at least somebody else in this room is applying different grammar rules. Okay, um, we're still talking about what's unique, special, and different about emojis. Um, another thing that's a little bit uh, different about emojis is that they perform a variety of communicative functions. If you look at the ways in which people express themselves, there's a bunch of different reasons why we express themselves or pick the particular tools or symbols that we use. So for example, sometimes emojis are used as, um, uh, as uh, word substitutes. You guys have all done this, I'm sure. Instead of saying, I love you, you say, I heart you. Yes, right? Some of you have done that. I do that to my kids all the time. Um, <laughs> I lost to the heartless one that wants to row kill the uh, chipmunk. So go, go <laughs> to the two more and you. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, um, so sometimes they're used as word substance. Sometimes there's words that use as word complements. They're used to emphasize words, kind of like bolding the word. Sometimes they're used as punctuation. In fact, this particular symbol is probably used more like a period than anything else. The court said this was also a sign that they were in a good mood, which was supposed to communicate to the landlord that they want to take the apartment. But most of us read this as a period with a rosy cheek. Is that right? Um, and uh, sometimes um, uh, emojis are used for what uh, ling the linguists call discourse management. Um, they're used to just like be the, the um, head nods and the arm waves and the body language that we use they're designed to send extra signals or metadata about what's going on in the communication. Um, and there's some other functions that emojis perform. Um, so one of the things that uh, words can sometimes do this, but usually words don't have that many different meanings. You can't use both word complements, word substitutes, it's just the word. Um, so, um, so emojis have different functions that are used, and so it requires an interpreter to think about which function was this emoji being used, and it might not be obvious. You might actually do some digging and thinking. That's a little bit different than some of the other communication functions that we use. And finally, emojis um, can form dialects. That's not unique at all. Emoji, uh, all different types of ways that we communicate form dialects. As you may know, different kinds of hand gestures have different meaning in different geographies. Different words will definitely have different meanings. Um, that's not unique whatsoever. Um, 
And so uh, dialects form based on language, they form based on culture, they form based on region. Now what's a little bit different about emojis is that emojis can form what I call platform specific dialects. So there can be a dialect that only people who use the Apple operating system understand that other people on other platforms might not understand. So for example, for a long time, Apple depicted the eggplant emoji this way and the peach emoji that way. And people, of course, went straight into the gutter and thought, that's a penis, that's a butt. <laughs> now, the eggplant and peach emojis on other platforms were not depicted in such a way. So for example, if you look at the famous Unicode outline, it just looks like a, a, flat, a, a round squatty thing. It doesn't look anything like a penis. And so other people on other platforms had no idea that when people were sending eggplants, they were getting the other direction. Um, <laughs> And so you had a dialect that was developing on Apple and not other places. Again, dialects are not unique, but what's unique about emojis is that they're forming these dialects on a platform basis so that you might cut across ge geography, you might cut across language, you might cut across culture, and yet there's still a different way in which people are communicating that um, uh, skews uh, the communications. Okay. The last big change is now something that is truly, I think, unique to emojis. Um, this is something I've been struggling to find any other example of how this takes place. Because of the fact that Unicode emojis are traveling across platforms, so going from uh, the um, Apple to the Android, or they're going from Twitter to uh, Facebook, uh, the fact that they travel across uh, these platforms um, and as they do so, they change their depiction. And as they change their depiction, the sender and recipient don't know that the depiction is being changed. They're never given a signal or warning about that. So because of that, the technology mediating the conversation, um, that's uh, mediating these exchange of information, is changing the depiction without disclosure. And because of that now, People are seeing different things, they don't know they're seeing different things, and they might each form reasonable interpretations of those different things that they're seeing and completely miscommunicate. So there are several ways that this comes up. Let's talk about this. So uh, one way is that as an operating system uh, issues a new version, it might implement new emoji depiction. So you might even have within the same platform Kind of incompatibility uh, situation. So this is uh, the one of the grinning faces again. Um, and so this is one of the older versions of the Apple um, iOS depiction, and that was a different one. Now this one is going to be interpreted as um, uh, very confusingly. People don't know how to interpret this uh, one with the, the grill. Um, they think that this sometimes is a positive message, but there's a bunch of people who think this is a negative message. So in uh, one study, they found that a large group of people thought that the bottom one meant that this person was ready to fight. This was like, let's go, let's, let's take it outside. Um, whereas the top one doesn't look like it has that same kind of negative valence. It looks like it's something that's kind of happy. And so you can have a situation, someone is sending the happy one, going to an older version of the Apple OIS, and they're getting the message, let's fight. The same kind of thing happens across platforms. So now not within the Apple system, but going from Apple to Android, Twitter to uh, Facebook. So these are a little bit outdated again. Um, but this is uh, the astonished face um, uh, Unicode outline. So this is what Unicode thought an astonished face would look like. And you can see that some of them look like that as well. This one looks like that, this one, this one. They all look like that. Now. This one is Google's old uh, implementation uh, using the blog. I don't know what this is, but there's no way under any circumstance I ever thought that meant astonished. Now also notice that we have this one. I don't know what this is, but this one looks a little bit more like a ready to fight one as well, right? It looks like uh, we got some violence coming. And then this one with the X's for the eyes, this is a normal um, meme that we would use to describe stuff like death. So here you've got someone who's trying to say, I'm astonished, and the recipient says, I'm going to kill you, right? <laughs> you are dead to me. <laughs> so as these emojis are traveling across the platforms, now, you can see now, sender saying, hey, I'm sending a nice message. Isn't that amazing? Recipient saying, oh my god, now I'm fear for my life. I need to call police. Um, 
There's another technology called the ZWJ. In order to make the Jolly Roger, you guys know this symbol, you combine two emojis, the flag, the great flag with the skull and crossbones. And then there's technology within the platforms that says, when you see these two together, combine them and produce this symbol. And not all the systems honor that. So you might send a, uh, a flag and a skull and crossbones, um, not thinking that that was some kind of uh, death threat, uh, and they might get the, the, uh, the Jolly Roger, or vice versa. You send the Jolly Roger, and what happens? Someone says, why are you sending me a skull and crossbones? It looks like you're going to kill me again. Um, so uh, again, the technology is changing the meaning without people realizing it. Um, in some cases, instead of it changing the meaning, the platform just drops the message, uh, uh, drops the emoji altogether. It can't process them, and it just omits them, or it replaces them with a white or black box. Some of you have experienced this. Like, why am I getting this? It's because the, there's a, a symbol that's coming to you that you don't know uh, what it is because the technology doesn't recognize it. You can imagine that dropped emojis could make a big difference. So, for example, if you drop an emoji that was designed to be suggest that you were being tongue-in-cheek, sarcastic, maybe facetious, that emoji gets dropped, people are just going to read exactly what you said. So, if you're, you know, uh, you know, saying, yeah, let's go rob that bank, ha-ha, with the emoji, the emoji gets dropped, you just said it looks like you uh, threatened to commit a crime. I have not been able to find any other good example where technology mediates a conversation and changes the meaning of the message along the way without telling people that it changed the meaning. So this is something that's relatively unique to emojis. This is a big problem. It was a uh, good study that just came out uh, late last year that showed uh, that about 25% of Twitter users, once they realized how their message was being changed across another platform um, by using Twitter said, oh, that's not what I meant. I regret having sent that particular message because it has been the meaning has been changed. So you multiply 25% times all the emoji usage across Twitter, and you should be thinking, this is a career growth opportunity for me. I want to litigate those cases and cash in accordingly. <laughs> okay, so why do we have all this, these diverse depictions of emojis. Go back to this astonished face depiction. Why do we have such radically different versions of the same symbol? Um, anywhere from pretty close to weird, uh, I'm sorry, to weird, to angry, to uh, fatalistic. Why do we have such different depictions? Well, let me offer my hypothesis that we have them because of intellectual property law. Um, so, Intellectual property law can protect em emojis at the individual level. So, for example, here are three different emojis. We've got the uh, eyes without a mouth. Uh, we got the uh, clown emoji and the stadium emoji. It's my position that the eyes without a mouth lacks enough expressive content to qualify for copyright protection. That though in other circumstances outside emojis, maybe we'd say that's an artistic statement of some sort or another, within the emoji context, it's it, there's not enough different ways to express eyes without a uh, mouth um, that this would rise to the level of copyright protection. Um, but I think there's no question that the clown depiction or the stadium depiction have a lot more expressive content. That might take them to the point where they could qualify for copyright protection. Each individual emoji has potential to qualify. Now, they also can qualify for trademark protection. Any of these can qualify for trademark protection. In order to get trademark protection, you simply need to um, use the symbol in commerce associated with your good. So if someone chooses a particular emoji and depicts it in a way that is trying to sell their uh, items, um, that could potentially start to create goodwill in that particular emoji and therefore qualify. So any of these can be protected by trademark, um, and I think at least the bottom two have a chance of qualifying for copyright protection. In addition, emoji sets can qualify for IP protection. So this is the entire universe of emojis that are available on a platform. I'll call them an emoji set. And uh, copyright law clearly protects at least the, what we call the selection arrangement coordination of the emoji sets. Uh, exactly what got in and what got left out, that's all protected by copyright law. And trademark law might protect the unique design elements that distinguish a particular set from other sets. So remember Google's blob with the half um, uh, moon shape and with the, uh, the fat lips. 
Um, those kinds of depictions might be eligible for trademark protection if they're used in a way that uh, trademark recognizes and if they're sufficiently distinctive enough. So once we say that a particular emoji depiction is eligible for copyright and possibly trademark protection, then we know that anyone who wants to do something identical to that is going to potentially run into copyright and trademark problems. And so what happens is that in order to avoid being liable for copyright and trademark protection in individual emojis or in emoji status, the particular unique attributes of those, that you're going to have to avoid having something that is either identical or substantially similar. This is kind of a, a, an efficient way of me saying a bunch of things. Just work with me for a moment. Uh, the idea is you want to have things that are not substantially similar enough that they would qualify for copyright or trademark infringement. And so this forces variations into emojis because people are saying, I want to depict a cloud emoji, but I can't depict anything that's identical to what other people have done. And I have to introduce my own details sufficient to make it distinctive enough that I'm distinguishing it from other depictions of the cloud. And this is really invasive into the way that we talk to each other. Individual word cannot qualify for copyright protection. Individual words can qualify for trademark protection, but they'll be limited to uh, restricting usage in competitive trademark situations, not in the ordinary discourse that you and I might have. Um, but once we allow IP protection for emojis, we start to let the uh, IP protection seep into these building blocks of communication, these individual blocks of um, uh, building blocks that we use to construct a sentence or construct a narrative. And each block then becomes restricted as opposed to the entire scope of the communication being restricted. That's something that we don't have good examples of either. Let's talk about some implications of the discussion I've had. So if you're an evidence geek, um, what about this uh, discussion matters to you? Um, if you are litigating in court over the depiction of emoji, what do you need to do? You need to make sure that you get the emoji that the sender saw, and you need to get the depiction that the recipient saw. They may not be the same thing. That could very well be the key to the case. If you got the depiction that shows that the sender uh, tried to communicate it, uh, ready to fight, but you go find the source and it's actually someone with a happy face, that's important. Or you might need to see the uh, omission to show that the emojis didn't make it through. Um, so the court needs to get all the right information, and that's on the, bur the burdens on the litigator. So you, as a litigator in a case, would need to be able to make sure that that evidence gets into court. To the extent that they have flexibility, and in many, in many ways they do, I'm happy to explore this in Q&A if you want, um, the courts, the copyright office, the trademark office should interpret the protection for emoji IPs narrowly. Remember that the, the, the protection for an emoji means that people are going to try and create immaterial variations in order to distinguish them. So if we can narrow down the amount of protection for individual symbols, we can increase the standardization of the depictions across uh, the platforms. We could also imagine that the platforms could cross-license their emoji sets to each other. They don't have to substitute in their own emoji if they have permission to use the emoji from the person, the platform that it was sent from. So you could imagine that Apple and uh, the Android systems could cross-license emojis. So if I sent from Apple to Android, the person doesn't see the Android depiction of a symbol, they could see the Apple one. They just need the permission to make that display. If they can't do the cross licenses, they could do some warnings to us as users. Remember, 25% of Twitter users were shocked to learn that they were sending a message that they didn't expect. So what could we do? We could have the platforms do a better job warning you. Hey, by the way, you should know that what you're sending is going to look different to the recipient, and you better be prepared for that. There's a bunch of ways they could do that. Happy to discuss that in Q&A as well. And finally, I've encouraged Unicode to be more aggressive about in, uh, getting the platforms to standardize their implementation. A lot has changed the last couple of years. There's been a lot of progress on this front. I'd like to claim credit. I don't think I can. This is something that's been an organic process. But still, even as we've seen increased standardization of emoji depictions across, across platforms, there's still immaterial violation, uh, uh, deviations in almost every single symbol. Like literally, uh, I use stuff like the eagle emoji. And some eagles are facing to left, some eagles are facing to the right. Why are they facing different ways? There's no good explanation for that. Um, so Unicode could do a better job of saying, hey, we're going to give you an, an eagle depiction, um, a symbol of what we want the eagle to look like. You need to keep it facing the same way. 
If you want to do something different, don't use our number because you're now not showing the same symbol. Um, I'm, as I mentioned to you, this talk is so important to our community because we are kicking off uh, a much broader ranging discussion about internet law. I'm so thrilled that you joined us today. Um, I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Questions, comments? Yes, sir. Google is pushing for having a standardized text messaging, which includes the emojis, the rich communication service. Um, uh, if that happens, would I mean, most of the people communicate over text messages than the wall gardens like Facebook Messenger or iMessage. Would most of the problems be resolved, which you're saying that you know, there may be misinterpretation between um, or did, did you do any research? So text messages are going to be covered by everything that we just discussed. Um, let me restate that. So if you send from uh, a text message from your Android device, the recipient who's using an Apple device is going to see different emojis. And I don't know what standardization I'm going to be talking about and if it would fix that problem, but I don't think until the, the platform's allowed to use each other's emojis, I don't think they're likely to fix that problem. Comments or questions? Let me ask you. No, you can continue. Oh, did you have a follow up? No. Please. Yes. Um, I guess there's different takes on, on the relationship to emojis, and I know some, at least in Norway, where I'm from, they're coming into government communication, like, and and they will kind of change meaning, not just by being there, but maybe by not being there. So I have a friend who, she don't want to use emojis, but when she says, thank you, that's nice, and just no emoji, think, are you a little bit, like, didn't you really like it? Because there's no smiley here, so why? So she started using the <laughs> exclamation mark. But then when they, if this interpretation thing is a problem, if I get an email from, my community service or tax authorities, they actually use sometimes emojis. That can be. about the IRS using emojis? <laughs> <laughs> I'm warmer and fuzzier now. Yeah. So yeah. Right to check with them. I think you kind of wanted to take the edge of it. Like, I'm, I'm not, like, you can commun you can ask your tax advisor anything, and I will use emojis. Hey, Anna, nice to thank you for your questions and a smiley face. But if that can create really, like, more serious problems than. Because I would, in a, in a message like that, I would kind of just disregard the emojis because I would put all kind of emojis just to be funny. Or, you know, it doesn't really, I haven't thought everyone through, at least when it's like a long bunch if, of if, if the IRS sent me an emoji, like a smile or whatever, I assume they're being sarcastic. They're like, <laughs> you don't have a choice whether or not to send me your money. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, Two things to observe. One, there is some strain of um, norm, especially in the legal community, that says don't ever use emojis in business context um, because uh, they have such cultural and language consequences that you may not be able to fully appreciate. And I think there's something to that. You need to understand your audience. And if you're miscommunicating to your audience, especially as lawyers, that's a problem. So you need to be careful about um, when you use emojis. Now, you can have my emojis out of my message when you call them from my cold, dead computer. So, you know, I'm not giving up on emojis, even in business context, um, but I could see why people would choose to do that. Um, but then that leads to the second problem, which is emojis become so ubiquitous, now you start to infer things from their absence. Why didn't you give me the hard symbol? Does that mean you don't really love me? Um, and so we're in the process of a wide-scale social shift in how we communicate. And there is going to be a relatively long transition period from the early adopters to the middle to the late adopters where people are going to get onto the norm. That's going to be taking place over the course of your entire life. Um, so during that period of time, this is where lawyers start to make money, right? You got an early adopter talking to a late adopter, they miscommunicate, cha-ching, go ahead and send your kids to private school. <laughs> <laughs> Comments or questions? Yes. So when new emojis spring up, where are these coming from? Who's developing them? And what kind of considerations go into that? So uh, Unicode has a process for adopting new emojis. 
It's arduous. It takes years. And they have a bunch of design parameters for what they'll accept and what they won't. But they are eager to fill in the gaps in their um, emoji sets. They know that there's a bunch of things that people want to be to emojis that don't exist, but they don't make it easy for that to be added. So if you were to go today, and you could today go and say, I have an idea for a new emoji. There's a process by which you can apply. You can submit it, but that will not be available to public for three or four years. In the best case, odds are it will be buzzed down by the Unicode process. Now, individual platforms can adopt proprietary emojis anytime, and they do so all the time. So there's new emojis being rolled out all the time, but the Unicode ones come in big, uh, in batches and uh, not very frequently. Yeah. So how have uh, character-based languages, have there been any comparisons between emojis and some aspects of character-based languages to kind of support this idea that they shouldn't be IP protected? Yeah, so um, there are other types of languages that are character-based as opposed to um, text-based or um, that are uh, image-based as opposed to uh, based on individual letters in an alphabet. Um, so uh, several of the Asian languages are image-based and they're examples of ways that people might communicate. Now what's interesting about those is that many of those image-based languages, um, that's how people grow up and think. They're used to that. What's different for us is that we're now dropping into our standard text communication a new set of graphics and learning how to incorporate those graphics into our standard messages. So we have a transitional period here that's a little bit different than the, um, uh, than the, uh, uh, than the image-based uh, language. Um, as an IP protection, um, I think globally there's a uniform standard that individual characters or individual images in the language context um, are not protectable, at least under copyright law. However, in the image-based country, that's because that's the small building block. Here, we protect images under copyright law as a matter of course. And so we have that conflict now where we're now switching from character-based uh, expression to image-based uh, expression, but our copyright law was built for a different model. So it's kind of might be a matter of time once emojis become more like mainstream, as in like people grow up using emojis as like a primary form of uh, communication, then it could <coughs> lend more of an argument to not allow an IP protection. That may sound a little bit crazy. Like, how could something be copyrightable today and not be copyrightable uh, 40 years from now? What would change if it's the same exact symbol? But in fact, I could make some arguments that that is a possibility. That because of the the integration of them into our communication. The legal standards might adjust. But that's why I put up there courts, copyright offices, trademark office should be interpreted as narrowly as possible to create as much freedom as possible. What happens in the common law system otherwise? We are precedent based. So if we set a precedent, they are protectable today. It takes years, if not decades, to overturn that precedent. So the common law is actually our enemy in a circumstance like this. It's designed to be flexible, to allow us to evolve uh, the law, but it also means that once we make a precedent, it's harder to overturn it and then go back. Um, I'll take one or two more questions and we'll break. Uh, any other questions? Did you want to follow up with another one? It's up to mid by now. You mentioned that uh, there's a concern that um, if platforms start copywriting or even trademarking these emojis, then then, then you're like um, blocking people from using the building blocks of communication. Mm -hmm. But most of the communication, uh, I mean, most of the use of these emojis is between common people like us. So wouldn't it fall into fair use? unless someone is going to like write a novel using emojis. <laughs> so there are breathing rooms. The doctrines have breathing rooms to allow us to talk to each other in ordinary ways. Um, and in general, what you just said is right. For example, if I send a particular clown emoji to you, um, that should be covered by fair use, even if the emoji itself was covered by copyright law. There's some other legal doctrines at play here, like implied license and stuff. There's some other reasons why I might be free to use it. But think in terms of the evil plaintiff. Think about how you would weaponize IP protection for a particular individual emoji, and think about how you might use that to, uh, to go and extract money. If you think that way, you'll start to say, wow, all these times people are doing things that might be legitimate, they're not gonna go wanna go to court to defend their rights and fair use, they might just pay a fee and you settle up. And so you can actually start to weaponize the IP pro process to re create some real havoc. And absolutely, I guarantee you, with the trademark side of things, where there's no question that you can get even the eyes without a mouth as a trademark, 
those kinds of weaponizations are coming for us, and we're going to all be explored for it. Um, there are thousands of copyright registrations for copyright and for individual emojis already on the books today. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of individual uh, emojis that have been trademarked. And there are, I'm guessing, at least hundreds, if not thousands, of individual emojis that have been protected by design patents. Every time you see that, think weaponization. How will this be misused to create a legal mischief? Uh, because some of you are going to make some, a lot of money on that as well. Uh, any last question before we wrap it up? Um, real quick, does anyone have the membership form? Where is the membership the sign-up sheet? Has we it gone to this side? Let's get over here as soon as we can. Last question. I have one. Yes, ma'am. Is the thumbs up an acceptance for a contract? Could the thumbs up be acceptance for a contract? We're going to actually do that with thumbs ourselves. If you think that a thumbs up could constitute an acceptance for a contract, put it up. If you think that a thumbs up would not constitute acceptance, it would not meet the requisite standards, give me a thumbs down. No, none of this. No. <laughs> give me a thumbs down. So I'm going to say it's maybe like four to one in favor. To me, my position, absolutely yes. In the right context, if someone understands the thumbs up is equivalent of saying, I agree, it's, as, it's, the tech, it's the visual equivalent of I agree, absolutely could qualify. But only in the right context. We're going to look at the entire scope of the communication, of what people might have meant by whatever preceded it, and then how that might have been interpreted. So there's plenty of circumstances where a thumbs up might look as if you're like, yeah, I agree, sure. Right? You could get that vocal inflection, you could have a sarcastic thumbs up too. Yeah. What if I accidentally clicked the thumbs up, but I meant to click the thumbs down? <laughs> so this is no joke, actually. Um, what we call emoji typos. Um, and emoji typos are a, a, a going to be a serious problem when they occur. I have no legal example for them occurring yet, so I don't quite know how we're going to interpret that. Um, the question is any different than if you uh, mistyped, if you made a typo in your text message, in your communication. It, it might be the same exact analysis. Unfortunately, that's not going to be all that clear. Those of you who know about mistakes or about misunderstandings from contract law, for example, know that the law is so confusing you probably didn't understand it and needed to understand. So that's what we're going to have to look for. Um, I'm going to say that we're at the end of this process here. Let me just point out that we have two things that you still need to do before you go. We have a little pizza, but we have cake here. The emoji has been chopped up into little pieces that you can enjoy without infringing IP. We also have a photo wall where you can get depictions that will help you remember this uh, historical inaugural event. Thank you very much for coming today.